So in this second section from chapter two, I'm going to be um, sharing a little bit about two figures. First is John Watson, and the second is Edwin Guthrie. And so uh, John Watson is actually considered to be the, the founder of American behaviorism. So um, he, he didn't make particularly strong contributions to theory, um, but his, um, his main contribution was really popularizing behaviorism. So uh, a little bit of background on him. He actually worked his way through graduate school as a rat caretaker, and uh, that might uh, factor into his most famous study. Um, he became a professor at Johns Hopkins University, um, and the study for which he's most famous um, involved uh, a child uh, by the name of Albert, little Albert. And uh, he actually resigned from Johns Hopkins because he had an affair with his graduate assistant, um, which at the time was a, a, a big scandal. Um, <clears throat> and he left academics for um, advertising. He became an, an executive and um, uh, likely applied a lot of what he had learned in his work as an academic to, to uh, designing commercials. And so Watson really defined behaviorism as, um, well, Watson really popularized the idea that psychology is about behavior. Um, it's a science of human behavior. And he was responding to the, the issue of introspection. He argued that introspection would, should not play a part in human psychology because consciousness is not, is not part of psychology. Uh, when we're reflecting on our thoughts, he thought that whatever that is, that's not psychology. Um, and uh, Watson, in fact, argued for a, a particular philosophical stance. He, he argued that human behavior should really be understood as a product of our environmental context. Uh, what pre proceeds and follows our behavior determines the way we act. And his um, his popularizing of, of behaviorism really succeeded. Um, American society embraced it and said, this is uh, kind of looked at it as the, the science of human behavior that would solve all of our, all of our problems. So, um, of course, we know from Pavlov, the idea is that classical conditioning operates through the process of some, some reflex. And Watson pointed out that we have a number of physical reflexes, and we covered some of those, um, but also that we have emotional re reflexes, uh, like fear, love, rage, things like that. And so um, arguing that some of these are just uh, inborn in us. So according to Watson, a lot of emotional behavior is, is a process of classical conditioning. He called it conditioned emotional reactions, where we take initially neutral stimuli, and we associate it with emotional reactions. So things like political parties, sports teams, um, different friends and enemies, uh, could our, our emotional reaction to those things can actually be the result of uh, kind, kind of combining an emotional stimuli with them. So you think of your favorite sports team, and you can think about maybe watching that, that team on the TV with your, um, with your dad or with your mom, with your uh, family, the excitement you feel and rooting for them and, and hearing the sport sportscaster get you excited for them, or maybe actually going to the, the, um, the game in person and having the, you know, the novel experience of being in a large stadium, you know, all those things kind of condition us to, get excited for our sports teams and, and same with our pol political affiliations. And uh, so all these things that we have various attitudes to towards could be the result of classical conditioning. Now, um, Watson's most famous study was with little Albert. And so I'm going to show you a, a video clip that shows his study with little Albert. And so I'm just going to actually play it as a part of this video. And I'm going to switch over here. 
There we go. Here we go. You can see there's no fear in response to the rat. He's able to just play with it. Here's a rabbit. Again, no real fear response. Okay, so you can see um, before and after he uh, had vastly different emotional reactions. So at first, he was just kind of playing, um, not showing any evidence of fear. And the video is a little grainy, but uh, hopefully you were able to see after the, um, after the conditioning occurred, he uh, responded to some with, with fear. So um, in terms of that example, he had bring back up he had uh, been classically conditioned and the unconditioned stimulus would be the loud noise and the unconditioned response would be the fear and the conditioned stimulus would be the rat and the conditioned response would be the fear of the rat and of the the other things that are closely uh, resembling a rat and so um, again just pairing it up the um, banged the iron six times and uh, paired that up with the rat. And so the rat was, became associated with this fear response. So we've, um, we've covered a few different types of classical conditioning. Uh, let me just review it already. Uh, most of these were in the last video. Uh, we have Pavlov's dog where we have food and uh, that's the unconditioned stimulus and then salivation, the unconditioned response. 
and we're pairing up a bell, which leads to a condition response to salivation. And then we talked about the quail experiment, which um, the unconditioned stimulus is a sexually available female, and then the unconditioned response is uh, approach, mounting, and copulation. And, uh, and then they were able to pair a light with that and actually um, led to approach behavior with the light. Uh, then we had some aversive conditioning where we had the fly shock. And so there was a shock, an attempt to escape. And then we paired the odor with the shock so that they attempted to escape from the odor. And uh, similarly, we had... Um, well, uh, I don't think we, we talked about this, but if you have a, uh, a rat in a cage where they are shocked, um, shock will be associated with freezing. Again, that's an un unlearned response. But if you t pair up a tone with the shock, then gradually that tone will bring about a freezing response. And then finally, the air puff is associated with a blink, um, but you can condition a uh, tone to go along with the air puff and that tone will be uh, will lead to a condition response of uh, blinking okay and again in this case the unconditioned stimulus is the loud banging of the iron and that led to the unconditioned response of fear and escape which is um, what they did is the conditioned stimulus was the rat and then the condition response was fear and trying attempts to escape from the rat Okay, so what Watson's really doing is he's broadening classical conditioning outside of just uh, you know physical reflexes, but actually saying emotional conditioning is the product of classical conditioning. Uh, so all, all it takes is just pairing a stimulus ordinarily associated with some negative emotion with another distinctive unconditioned stimulus. So I, in this picture, I, I give you, um, it's a picture of the durian fruit. Uh, I've never, I don't know if you've ever experienced durian, but it has an extremely pungent smell to it. And so uh, if you've never experienced durian, then you may look at that picture and just say, okay, um, it's sort of a, you know, a fruit of some sort, uh, an exotic fruit. You might think it's sweet, but if you've experienced durian and if you had a, a negative experience with it, um, you know, some people think it's it's wonderful, but uh, I actually had a, a roommate who brought it to our apartment, and I my association with it was just a horrible, pungent smell. I couldn't even bring myself to try it because I, I couldn't get close enough to it to actually take a bite. Um, but uh, so for me, that that picture elicits a a little bit of a sort of a disgust response. Uh, you know, it makes me a little bit nauseous to look at it. Again, it's a, it's a conditioned stimulus. It's not something, it's initially neutral, but once you have an experience with it, it can be, uh, get a conditioned response. And similar, similarly, you can condition a positive emotional reaction to neutral stimuli. And I don't know if you remember the Mac versus PC commercial. Uh, this is back in the, I think, early 2000s. You had a, uh, a commercial where the Mac was this cool character um you know just a, a likable figure and the pc was a sort of a nerdy slightly overweight um guy who just talked in a in a, a sort of annoying tone and so what it did is it, it associated the positive emotional reaction to the the mac and the negative emotional reaction to the pc um and and so, again, we use this kind of principle in commercials and advertisements. Um, and they also talked about, um, Watson talked about counter conditioning, saying that if you have an emotional reaction to something already, um, you can actually change it by having a positive experience. So let's say you hate Nickelback, but for one reason or another, you go to a, a Nickelback concert. I don't know if they're still playing. Uh, but you see them play and actually enjoy them, that would be counter conditioning. You used to have a negative experience, but now you have a positive experience, and that can uh, sometimes override the negative experience that you have. 
But what I really think find interesting about Watson is that he is uh, just incredibly a, a proponent of uh, environmentalism. And, uh, but you might think of it as more of the nurture camp. So uh, you're probably familiar with this nature nurture um, controversy where those who believe in, in nature as being really um, primary say that humans are primarily a product of genetic makeup. And then the nurture camp says humans are molded and shaped mainly by their environment. Well, um, Watson had a uh, overall a philosophy that in, really emphasized nurture. And in, in particular, there's a quote that he gives that uh, really exemplifies his attitude. He writes, give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, and my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee, guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any, any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant chief, and yes, even beggar man and thief. So if you, um, if you really read into that quote, what is it saying? It's saying if, you give, um, if we were to give to him 12 healthy infants, he is arguing that if he had his own world in which to raise them, he can uh, basically select what kind of a person they would um, grow up to be. Uh, he could determine that, that this one will be a doctor, this one will be a lawyer, this one will be an artist, having um, no bearing on what are their preferences, what do they enjoy, what are they, you know, what are their internally, um, what, well, even what are their capabilities? What is their intelligence? He believes it's entirely determined by the environment that they're in and not only um, positive, but he believes that negative behaviors like being a beggar or being a thief is entirely the, the outcome of the environment that they were raised in. So Watson is arguing that experiences determine all that people do. And if you think about it, what does that mean? It means that humans are basically equal. Now, in our day and age, this is not all that controversial, but in his time, this was really the rise of the eugenics movement. So um, in, in this era, uh, this was sort of the, the breeding grounds of, of Hitler and, and his philosophies and uh, the anti-Semitism and, and racism and all, all these different perspectives that were arguing that some people are you know, basically better than others and that um, that's the product of nature. So in, in that context, he's really uh, resisting this idea and saying we are the product of our environment and if we give people the right environment, then they can thrive. And so I, I think that's something I really appreciate about Watson is that he, well, basically he believes in people. He believes that, that people can be uh, good and that uh, with the right environment around them, we can raise people up to be good people. Okay, so what are some practical applications of Watson psychology? Um, so on the upside, of course, is that yes, there's equality of persons, but in, in some ways, Watson goes too far. He doesn't really appreciate that there are you know, real differences among individuals. Um, he's ignoring that people might have goals for, for what kind of life they might have for themselves. He's ignoring that people might actually have different abilities, that some people are better at music than others, some people are better at sports, some people are better at, at uh, you know, academic work. And, um, and so that sort of overlooks this idea that, um, yeah, that there are any real differences between people. And, uh, and, and certainly it seems like, uh, at least to some degree, there, there must be some differences, right? There is diversity. Um, the, the other application is really that a, a lot of fields like parenting, education, military, industry, uh, it started emphasizing that what we do must be really rigid. Um, we need to ignore what a person is thinking and basically just condition their behavior. And as a part of that is this idea of repetition being the key. So you get teachers who are uh, giving drill-based um, exercises in classroom. 
again, it's not about, you know, self-efficacy or believing in yourself or having a cognitive understanding. The only thing they care about is repetition, getting to the accurate um, behavior. And so it's all about the behavior. So if you think about it, what does all this uh, mean? Well, again, his theory became in immensely popular and was very influential. It, again, shaped the way a lot of Americans viewed people. Um, he probably exaggerated the role of learning um, and underemphasized uh, heredity and biology. Um, but overall, he did, he did a lot to make um, psychology more rigorous, more objective, and, um, and, and really popularized the notion that environmental experiences are potent forces in shaping behavior patterns. So again, when we think about you know various childhood experiences um, and uh, the fact that we appreciate that those have a, a role to play in you know someone's criminal behavior or in someone's mental disorder, a lot of that was the work of of John Watson and sort of laying the foundation for that. Okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna shift gears to another figure. Um, Edwin Guthrie is not as famous as John Watson or obviously I, Ivan Pavlov. Um, the, the book talks about his theory, and, and so I, I find it really interesting because it does illustrate some applications that are, that are interesting, um, but, uh, but just be aware that, that this theory isn't as mainstream as, um, as uh, the overall uh, Pavlovian classical conditioning. So Guthrie was born and raised in Nebraska. His father owned a bicycle and piano shop. His mother was a school teacher, so he was, he was fairly middle class. He was, a, he was actually a high school teacher, um, and he got a PhD in philosophy, but he shifted over to psychology. Um, he's actually known for being pretty irreverent in his, in his writing, uh, very filled with humor and anecdotes. Um, in fact, one of the things that you might appreciate about Guthrie is he wrote a lot about docs. So a lot of our current knowledge, like um, we know that uh, we do a lot of dog training and his work probably was very influential in, in bringing that about in, in pointing out that um, conditioning could be used for training dogs. Okay, so um, Guthrie argued for he, what he called the law of one-shot learning. And um, I'll try to unpack this for you to, to be able to understand it. He argued that um, a combination of stimuli, which is accompanied a movement, will on its re recurrence tend to be followed by that movement. So um, what that actually means is that um, if you are um, experiencing certain stimuli and you do something, then if you were to experience those stimuli again, then you'd likely do exactly the same, same thing. He argued that the full, uh, the bond between a stimulus and a response is either all or nothing. Um, it's, it's full strength once it's learned. Um, so if you are, uh, if you have some stimuli experience and you do something, that connection between the stimuli and your action is, um, again, all or nothing, that you learn that or you don't learn it. Um, and what he argued is, um, is a little bit different from what Pavlov argued. He, Pavlov kind of argued that we're, we're pairing up an unconditioned stimulus with a conditioned stimulus. And that's where the, the bond is actually occurring. Uh, so Pavlov thought about it a little bit differently and said what we're really learning is between a stimulus and a, re and a response. So um, again, to, to really grasp that, it's uh, when you look around you, you can see certain things. You have lights, you have, um, again, visual information, hearing, sounds, smells, etc. cetera. And um, those are all stimuli. And so what Guthrie is saying is that when we have a particular experience um, with lights, with sounds, with, with uh, 
the smells and all of our sensations. And when we do something in that context, we are likely to do that again when the situation is similar. So we're going to learn a connection between a, a stimulus, all the things that we're perceiving, and our behavior. And, um, and so Guthrie said that if we don't have a reflex, well, we know we're going to do something. Human beings are always doing something. So what Guthrie argued is that if, if I'm in a situation and I'm having a certain kind of sensations and perceptions and I do something, it might be random at that first time, but whatever it is I do, I'm probably going to repeat that the next time around just because that's how my, um, he, what he thought are the way our brain worked, that we learn these connections between sensations and, and actions. So um, when you have a certain stimuli, we know that um, you, you're really not likely to ever have two stimuli experiences that are exactly the same because at any given moment, things are always changing, right? In, even in this room, um, I, I hear, have certain sounds, I have certain sights, but things are, are changing. Not Again, in, in my office, not a whole lot, but um, what's on the screen in front of me changes as I go throughout this lecture. Um, the sounds I hear are a little bit different. Again, there's a... Um, so I'm not repeating the same thing over and over and over again because even my own voice, I'm hearing myself talk. And so each um, moment, I'm having a different sen sensory experience. So um, Guthrie says basically that we tend to perform the same way. Uh, we have these tendencies. And that practice is opportunities to have different sensations and perceptions that might generalize our specific reaction in a, in a certain circumstance. That uh, practice provides an opportunity for making the same response in a wide variety of different situations. Um, so we learn all or nothing, but we need to le learn all or nothing uh, in a variety of different circumstances to really be able to, to respond effectively in all these different circumstances. And so, uh, and Guthrie argued that there's a, an additional thing, and I think this is really what I, I like about Guthrie, that he adds, um, that we, we should consider. And that is movement produced stimuli. So a stimulus is not just one sens sensation, but rather is a combination of numerous sensations. Again, this room I'm having um, is, is a stimuli, but it's a combination of, of sight, sounds, smells, um, and, uh, well, uh, I'll leave the, the smells out, but, um, yeah, I, I'm having, um, a compound experience of sensations and, um, and, uh, so learning is about associating a response to the combination of stimuli. So not like Pavlov saying, oh, it's just a bell. No, um, what the dog is actually hearing a bell, but it's, occurring with a certain tone, there's certain sounds, uh, sorry, there's certain sounds with the tone, but also certain sights and certain, um, again, there's other stimuli going on uh, outside of the bell. And so um, the stimuli is a com complex compound of sensations. Similarly, the response is not just a simple salivation response like um, Pavlov would argue, but saying it's our, our, our response is a whole set of muscle movements and uh, a variety of different actions. So um, the, the sound of a bell, what, is it, what does it do? It's a sensation, but it leads us to respond in a certain ways. We might turn our ears or a dog might put its ears up, move, move its eyes, uh, maybe it moves its head and its neck. And so there's a variety of muscle movements. Again, Pavlov simplified it as if it's just a simple salivation response, but there's actually a lot of stuff going on in the dog's response to the, the bell. And 
every motion is a stimulus to many sense or organs in muscles, tendons, joints. Um, and, uh, and so what Guthrie argued is that these stimuli um, are movement produced stimuli. So our actions are actually stimuli. Our responses are stimuli. Okay, so when we uh, respond to, okay, if I, if I hear a bell, I move, I, I'm like, I have to orient to it, I, I respond to it. Well, Guthrie says, when you move, well, what are you experiencing? I feel my neck moving, I, I can, my eyes are shifting, my visual field is shifting, I'm getting um, movement produced stimuli. So, um, what, what Guthrie argued is that with, um, when we do go about our day, we're getting a sequence. We have a stimulus and then we have a response. And then our response produces a internal stimulation. Uh, we experience, uh, you know, if I'm going out to, to grab a, a coffee cup, that movement of my arm is, again, stimulus. I feel my body. It, we call it proprioceptive response, the feelings of our body. And I feel the extension of my arm, the, uh, you know, the weight of my shoulder and, and things like that. And so um, each of these responses and their corresponding movement produced stimuli are in contiguity. They occur at the same time. And so they become associated. And, uh, and Guthrie said, this is what guides behavior. So when we're walking, we're, we're seeing that we're moving and then we're moving and then we're experiencing ourselves moving. So the experience of ourself moving is a new stimulus that guides our ongoing walking ability. Um, I know that's kind of hard to, to understand, but, um, hopefully this next slide will explain it. And, um, but uh, let me give another example. Um, learning a, a skill, an athletic skill. So if I, I, I used to play basketball and um, in learning how to shoot, it was a process. I, again, like when you first shoot a basketball, you're, you kind of like throw it up like that with both hands and you want to learn how to shoot with just one hand because there's greater accuracy when you shoot with just one hand and you want to learn how to flick the ball a certain way and there's a whole set of skills that, that, that seem to um, be associated with shooting more accurately. Well, how do, we, how do we learn how to shoot a basketball? Well, when I grab a ball, I am grabbing it, and I have the sensation of the basketball, but I also have the sensation of holding the basketball. And then I have the sensation of moving it, and then I can see it move, and yet I can also feel it, the, the movement. I can feel the ball and the, the shift of the weight of the ball. And then I can feel as it lifts up and how I extend my arm. And, um, and so I am getting each movement is associated with new stimuli. Um, I feel my body moving. And so what Guthrie argued is that any kind of skill-based movement is classical conditioning. Again, I, I find this really interesting. So let me give an, ex uh, an example of this. So let's say you hear uh, what you, you, you think you hear the first strains of the national anthem. What do you do? Well, you might stand up. When you stand up, you feel your body in a new way. You are sitting, and when you stand up, you feel your body um, change, right? You're, your muscles, new muscle, muscles are tensing, other muscles are relaxing. You feel um, just the sensation of your body being in a different position. And, um, right, and once you've done that, you stay standing. Um, so you continue to stand. And you feel your, which produces more stimuli related to changing auditory, kinesthetic, and visual sensation, right? You see the world differently when you're standing. And, um, and then you remove your cap. And again, there's new stimuli as you, as you remove your cap and hold it here. And uh, 
this is where it gets a little silly. Um, it wasn't the, the, really the national anthem after all. And so you realize, oh, I need to sit down. And uh, as you sit down, that produces more movement produced stimuli. Um, so again, I, I think this is really interesting because it suggests that um, just every movement is this process of um, we, we are learning about our world and we're adjusting our behavior with the world because we're pairing up our stimuli and responding to it. So Guthrie argued that um, uh, learning occurs in one trial, but this doesn't mean that a complex behavior can be learned in one trial, right? We don't learn how to shoot a basketball by only shooting one time. Um, so again, each component of the stimulus response associations that make up a complex act requires only a single behavior, a single pairing. But to, to um, create the full sense of uh, a uh, behavior, you need a lot of associations. So if I picked up a basketball the first time and I shot it and it went in, I've learned how to do that. And let's say if I picked it up in exactly the same way, if I moved my body in exactly the same way, and if I shot it, I might actually make it again. Um, I, Guthrie would say that that would be likely, but it would be unlikely to pick it up in the same way, to feel it in the same way, to, to, for everything around me in my visual field to be exactly the same. And as a result, I'm probably going to miss because I'm, I don't have a habit established. Um, I, I don't have a complex representation of different stimuli and, and different responses. Okay, uh, so again, habits, uh, humans are, are not completely predictable. They don't respond exactly the same way every time they're placed in the same situation. So again, it could be that two stimuli are different. Um, oh, sorry, if responses to stim two stimuli are different, it's because the st stimuli are not exactly identical. Um, it may be that through one of a number of procedures, a new habit has replaced an old one. The old one is not forgotten, it is merely replaced. Okay. Um, I, I, I wouldn't worry too much about that second one. Um, what about reward and punishment? So according to Guthrie, um, reward, rewarding a behavior doesn't do anything to strengthen stimulus and response. Again, it's all or nothing. When you do, when you have a certain stimuli and you do a certain thing, you learn it. It's, it's ironed in. What reward does is it changes the stimulus and situation. Um, so that the uh, the animal or the person doesn't learn something different, doesn't learn something contrary to what it's supposed to be learning. Punishment can change a stimulus situation and serve in Guthrie's words to sidetrack a habit. Um, so according to Guthrie, um, let's say a child misbehaves. Well, how do, um, or you know a child's throwing a, a temper tantrum. What's happening? Well, the child is uh, has a behavior, and that temper tantrum, the, the behavior that the child is showing, is a stimulus. And so it's basically reinforcing itself. It's basically just perpetuating itself. And what Guthrie says, you just break up the, the habit, and you change the behavior. So you don't have to spank a child. You just need to do something that will surprise the child you know you can you can uh you know dance with the child you can do anything that would dist distract the child from what they're currently doing and that could that could uh stop the temper tantrum um let's see here yeah so all that punishment uh, the reason why it if it works it works by interrupting the unwanted habit so anything that grabs attention and brings about a different behavior will work to, to effectively punish a behavior. Okay, so wrapping up Guthrie, um, the last slide from this section. Uh, so basically his theory is relatively simple. It's, it's, it's very practical because we get to understand how our sensations in our body are connected to our behaviors. Um, 
So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about how each, each thing we do is produced by the sensations of the fact that we're doing it, but it doesn't actually give us a lot of guidance for clinical work. Um, so that's kind of its downside. Um, and so in our last section from chapter two, I'm going to talk about some clinical applications. I, I'm largely going to leave Guthrie out, but I'm going to talk about, you know, Pavlov and Watson and how they view some of our um, behavioral problems that people have, like addiction and phobias. And uh, we'll, we'll think through how do we actually help people with, um, with these principles, right? Um, so this class hopefully will, will equip you to be a, a good therapist. And so that will be in part three of this chapter. All right.